Oh, I would like to thank the organizers for this kind invitation, and I would like to thank people in the audience for being uh, awake early in the morning, nine o'clock. Uh, that's appreciated. Here in Tokyo is one in the morning, so I hope not to fall asleep. Uh, uh, this work is in collaboration with Robert Johansson, who was a student and the postdoc here, and with people at Chalmers University, uh, Chris Wilson and Waterloo, Joran Johansson, uh, Paul Bakirian, Tim Duty, Simeon, and Per Delsin, who's the head of the group there. Also, there is some work with Paul Nation, who was a postdoc in my group right now at IBM, and Miles Blank at Dartmouth. And uh, let me just continue here. So, uh, the goal here is to stimulate uncertainties, how to amplify the quantum vacuum. If you want to see a longer version of this talk, it's available online at our website. And uh, there's a pedagogical review on how to amplify the quantum vacuum using supercondotent circuits. It's an old review, but we're having some more papers on related topics now. Uh, so therefore, the theory was presented in three papers, and eventually this led to an experiment. I had more theory, and then afterwards, uh, we also published a review, and this work is ongoing. There is additional experimental data, which is a better one, a better analysis published about a year ago, and then, uh, but confirmed the previous results in a more accurate manner. So this is ongoing work. We have also more recent work on the mechanical aspects of the dynamic Casimir effect, a, a presentation on the mechanical aspects is available online at our website. We do not have experiments yet on these topics, so I'll be focusing more on the superconducting stuff where there are a series of experiments. And as soon as we get the experiments working out on these with collaborators, then this will be announced. But this is still the mechanical effects are still work in progress. So therefore, the vacuum in classical physics is empty in quantum mechanics, the ground state, uh, it has a zero point energy, but there are these fluctuations even in the vacuum state. And the vacuum is empty on average, but these fluctuations can be described as virtual particles that spontaneously appear and disappear in pairs. So therefore, this is the standard way to present it. These vacuum fluctuations as virtual particle bubbles. So therefore, they are produced here, and then they, they eliminate. So the idea started in the 1970s by Moore, Bryce David, and other researchers is to consider a mirror. And then this mirror oscillates fast. And if you do it fast enough, you're breaking the bubble. So therefore, instead of allowing it to recombine, you're actually breaking it, and then you're generating photon pairs, which are correlated, and this correlation can be measured. It's a, it's a two-mode squeeze state. These are quantum mechanically entangled uh, photons. We have a common origin. And the question we're thinking for a long time is how to measure experimentally these, these uh, virtual photons, but we need to convert them into real photons. And this is the way to do it. That was in the 1970 and 74, 75. There are a series of papers there. Around 1974, 75, Hawking had a different approach. He considered the event horizon, which is acting like this very fast moving mirror, breaking the virtual pair. But in this case, you measure only one photon. The second one is gone. So therefore, you do not really know if this one here comes from the event horizon or not. The, the bubbles, which are away from the event horizon, they recombine. So therefore, these pairs of virtual particles are broken up by one being trapped. So therefore, these are examples of quantum vacuum effect. The first one was the lamp shift, 1947. And this gave a big impetus to quantum field theory and quantum electrodynamics, because this energy shift here could not be explained by the standard quantum mechanics. You had to introduce vacuum fluctuations. And that was a big breakthrough in 1947. Then came 1948 with a paper by Casimir that was eventually seen by Lamoreo in 1997, uh, Capasso and other groups later on. And then, uh, and these are all physical phenomena to quantum fluctuations with no classical counterparts. 
Dynamic Casimir effect was 1970, 72, 74, 70. There are several papers by different groups there. And then Hawking, 74, 75, UNRU, uh, right afterwards, I think it was 76, 78, I forgot. So therefore, uh, these, these are examples of these quantum vacuum fluctuations. Uh, our review is studying this, to, trying to relate these together and how to observe this using some uh, quantum circuits. Our approach is to think of this from the point of view of quantum optics, because we have been doing a lot of quantum optics for a long time. So therefore, we have a pump, nonlinear medium, a signal, and an idler. So therefore, this is called parametric amplifier. The pump photon is down converted by a nonlinear medium into a signal and an idler photon, and the frequencies adapt. So you add idler frequency plus this gives you the pump frequency. So that was our starting point. Let's think about this as a quantum optics problem. Then we start with a parametric amplifier as a quantum optics problem. And then we're trying to figure out, well, how to relate these effects, because they are typically studied separately. And I couldn't find a single paper that could actually try to pedagogically go from one to the other one. So we said, okay, let's try to do it. So therefore, let's look at relations between these quantum amplification mechanisms, counterclockwise from the parametric amplifier, bottom left. For a single mode of you know, the vacuum, the non-degenerate parametric amplifier and the UNRU effect share the same form of the Bogolyov transformations, resulting in both exhibiting a two mode squeeze states. So therefore, like if you look at the derivations, there are some underlying analogies between them. To go from the UNRU effect to the Hawking radiation, they're connected through the equivalence principle relating inertial and gravitational acceleration. The exponential redshifting or Doppler shift of the field modes near the horizon creates a Bogolyov transformation that are identical to the ones used in dynamic Casimir effect, provided the mirror trajectory is given by this an equation that essentially is an oscillation. Like, uh, so here we obtain an identical Doppler shift leading to a thermal spectrum for the meter radiation. Finally, the dynamic Casimir effect and the generated parametric amplifiers can be related by considering the case of a single mode cavity with a sinusoidally time dependent boundary condition. This can be formalized in a more rigorous manner, looking at our RMP because it's explained there pedagogically. So these effects were first discovered in seemingly only the context the universal description of this quantum amplification provided by this Bogolyov transformation suggests these mechanisms are in fact closely related and, and there is a way to actually do it formally do it via this uh, transformation there. So now of this all effect, we're going to forget all of them and focus only in the red box here. So we have this oscillating mirror here, there are vacuum fluctuations, and we're going to generate these vacuum pairs, which are correlated. The rest, we're going to forget them. So let's look at an overview of the static and dynamic. In the static case, it's a force. In the dynamic case, there is no force. You're generating photons. Could be a, typically an oscillating mirror in a vacuum field. This one is 1948. This one by Moore should be called the Moore effect. 1970, single mirror by Fulling Davis, also the bit around 74, 75, 76. So there are different people around that time. And it took about 40 years to do, to eventually it was found in 2011, 2013, and there are some more recent experiments by our collaborators, 2020, looking at this entanglement in a more careful, systematic manner, and everything matches very beautifully, very nice. So this is still ongoing uh, uh, progress. So therefore, there is no, should not be no confusion. In this case, it's a force attracting, in this case, oscillating mirrors, photon pairs generated. So there's no force here. It's a complete different ball game. There's a nice review by Dodonov in 2020, and then using a simplified 1D model, Moore in 1970 showed that motion of an ideal boundary of a cavity could result in generation of quanta of the electromagnetic field from the initial vacuum quantum state. So this would be called Moore effect. Eventually, a few years later, David demonstrated that moving boundaries could induce particle creation from a vacuum using a single meter setup. That was 1975 in a physics report by David, and then more detailed study were done by Fulling and Davis in 1976-77. Uh, so it's, uh, that was the 
beginning of this. So step by step, more and more people were working on this. And some people were calling non-stationary Casimir effect, dynamic non-adiabatic Casimir effect. Uh, Yablonovic also was working on this, but that was like 1989 and how to see it. And then uh, non-stationary Casimir effect. Schwinger was working on this for a while, and then Schwinger decided that the, the notation should be called dynamic Casimir effect, and that somehow that was the name that stuck with it, although it should be called the Moore effect because it was really predicted by Moore, and after it was David and Fulling and others did beautiful work on this. There are hundreds of papers on this, and then uh, so typically called mirror induced radiation or motion induced radiation or Moore effect or dynamic Casimir effect. So this is about the history of the problem in a few slides. So we have the mirror here, and there are lots and lots of theory papers, but it's very difficult to see this effect experimentally. This is the Achilles heel of this entire field. There are way too many theory papers. So therefore, the question we were wondering is, okay, how to make a prediction that could be seen experimentally? We just didn't want to do one more theory paper. We just simply just uh, had to think about a different approach. So let's look here at the, at, the, at the background. So you have a mirror undergoing non-uniform relativistic motion in vacuum emits radiation. So this is the Moore effect or Moore, David, Fulling, Davis effect. You change the boundary condition very quickly uh, of a quantum field, modify the mole structure of the quantum fields non-adiabatically. This creates an amplification of these virtual photons to real detectable photons, this radiation. So this is the goal here. So people were thinking about moving mirror in the vacuum. Jablonovic had a very good idea, is meeting with a time-dependent indusor refraction. It's a beautiful paper by Elia Jablonovic. Semiconducting switchable mirror by laser radiation by Braggio et al. Our proposal was completely different. Let's, let's think about weight guides, superconducting weight guides, to minute about by a squid. It was partly due, due to the fact that I have been working on superconducting circuits for over 20 years. So it was natural proposal from our group to try to see if this different approach will work. So the problem is massive mirrors. That's the problem. So if you look at a mirror by hand, it's a hand waving experiment. You put a graduate student, um, one meter amplitude, frequency one hertz, maximum velocity one meter per second. The production rate of photon is one in 10 to the minus 18. So the student will have to be hand waving the, the, the mirror for about a century or longer, and then you need to pay pension, retirement benefits, et cetera. So you wouldn't get it on time. So the nanomechanical oscillator, the frequency is much higher, but the amplitude is much smaller. The maximum velocity is the same. It turns out that you can do a much higher production rate by over 10 of orders of magnitude, but it's still too small. The photo production rate is given by this, the number of photons produced per unit time, oscillating frequency, Peak velocity is uh, omega a, the speed of light. So you need to have a velocity which is significantly, which is large. So the very low photon production rate makes this effect very difficult to detect experimentally, insisted with mechanical modulation of the boundary condition. So this was the killer. That's why we thought this is not going to work. So we need a system that does not require moving mass in objects to change the boundary conditions. How do you do that? So this is the cartoon of the dynamical Casimir effect. You have a box here, you close the box, you shake it, you open up, and then boom, there are these photons going all over. But the rate of production rate is way too low. It will take many, many years to get enough photons, so the cartoon is misleading. And indeed, that's why no experimental observations have occurred for more than 40 years, since 1907, 2011. So, so that was the Achilles heel of the field, is that there is no way to measure the damn photons. It's just simply this approach doesn't work. So we thought about the following. If you take a squid in a coplanar wave guide, the frequency is much higher. Typically, easily 10 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz, it's very, very high. Amplitudes are much larger than the ones in a mechanical oscillator, and the maximum velocity is much larger than anything ever approach before. That was the key point. With this, the photon production rate became massively larger. And this estimate indicated that the way to go 
is to do with superconducting circuits, this squid in a coplanar waveguide. So this is the main idea in this slide. So essentially how to increase the photon production rate, knowing that this is the expression that produced them. And we knew that this, the superconductor circuits operate at frequencies that semiconductors can dream of, essentially you just cannot get to 20 gigahertz, it's just or even larger. Than. So therefore that was the key breakthrough. So therefore, for the uh, people not familiar, a squid refers to two Johnson junctions in parallel forming a loop. This can be seen as a, as a voltage to flux transducer, like is useful for many applications, but in, in electronics, you can think of it as a flux tunable inductor. It's a, it's a, it's a nonlinear inductor that changes with the field. And squid means superconducting quantum interference device, it's an abbreviation, and it's not this type of squid because people are asking me, why are they using squids? These are, these are different ones. And then uh, coplanar waveguide. These are used to confine microwaves to the chip. Namely, you're creating a 1D electromagnetic environment. This coplanar waveguide have a center conductor right here and two ground planes. And you can think of it, you take a coaxial cable and whack, you cut it in the middle. So this is the cross section of a coaxial cable. So that's what the coplanar waveguide is. So this is important. Then you glue them together. You have your coaxial cable, which you cut it off, coplanar waveguide, and the squid. There are two junctions here, and you apply the magnetic flux right here at a very high, very high frequency. So this is our proposal in 2009, 2010, and then the boundary conditions for the waveguide is this one here, determined by the squid. It can be tuned by the applied magnetic flux. Is effectively equivalent to a mirror with a tunable location. So if we have a mirror, but this mirror is not massive, it's an electromagnetic mirror. And this is the key difference from anything ever proposed before. So there is no motion of massive objects. And you can change the boundary condition. The maximum speed is about 25% of the speed of light. It could be done higher, but typically electron lithography uses circuits which are made of aluminum. To do it higher would require Niobium, which is far less common, is more expensive, it could be done. There are typical two ways to do superconducting circuits. Niobium is rarely done, it's more expensive. And then you could go to perhaps half the speed of light because the Josephson plasma frequency is higher. So you can actually pump at higher frequencies and not create a spurious excitation in the system. But this was essentially enough to get this going. Eventually, I hope some people will do it with Niobium and get to higher speeds. The equivalent system is shown right here. So there's an effective mirror and the mirror length changes. The location of the effective mirror is a function of the applied magnetic flux. You change the flux, you're changing the junction. You're changing the, this is the effective inductance of the squid. So the squid is, a, is like a, think of it like a nonlinear inductor. Actually, actually just on junction nonlinear inductor, you have two of them. And then the effective length can be modulated with the field and then, uh, and the frequencies are very high, 5 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, 15, 20. Typically, experiments are done about 11 gigahertz in this case here, although there were some of them were by 15, 20 gigahertz. So the photon flux density is produced. It is N omega out in the transmission line when the frequency, which is one here, of this flux impinging or, or, or going through the squid becomes high enough. So there is a, it's a perfectly reflective mirror at a distance. So this essentially, essentially is like this, an, it's an oscillating mirror. We consider harmonic modulation of applied magnetic flux gives a boundary condition like the one of oscillating mirror and produces photons in a coplanar waveguide. So therefore the question is how to force these virtual photons to be emitted. So this is the non adiabatic modulation of the Rabi frequency, this light matter coupling here. And then, uh, and then you can see here on top is the cartoon of what people are expecting. You take a mirror, you oscillate very fast, and you get these these two more squeezed states. These are two photon correlated uh, correlated photons entangled. So we replace the mechanical mirror by the squid right here, and there are photons in the coplanar wave guys. So this is like a is like a quantum simulator, a quantum emulator where you are mapping this system 
in the quantum regime into another one. And there are many people doing these quantum simulators now because it allows to study phenomena in ways that couldn't be done before. So the transmission line resonator is terminated by tunable inductance, which you can see here in this cartoon here. And then in this case, the squid is a tunable inductor, which is at the end of the transmission line resonator. And this is obtained this is essentially how it looks like, and this is the cartoon of it. This is the circuit diagram. In order to do that, we need to see when you change the flux from zero flux to, let's say, 0.2 flux quantum, how the effective length changes. And you can see here that the, the, the effective length changed of the order of millimeters. So therefore, a, by changing the flux, you can actually see a real essentially change in the location of the mirror in terms of about a millimeter or so. So the circuit mode is the following. You assume symmetric squid for simplification. The complainer wave guide, the transmission line is LC chain. This is a squid here. This can be mapped exactly into an effective field dependent uh, Joson junction here. So therefore, the squid behaves an effective junction with a tunable just on energy with this one here. And then these can be changed at a very high frequency over 10 gigahertz, creating this fast oscillating mirror. So the boundary condition can be written, you write a Hamiltonian, there is a kinetic energy here, a potential energy. You essentially assume that the squid is only weakly excited. This can be done because the Joson plasma frequency is large, for aluminum is large, for novin is even larger. You can approximate this in this regime. The question of motion at that point gives you the boundary condition for the transmission line, which we have there. So we have an exact expression for the boundary condition. And then this is the, the field as a function of X and T. The Josephson uh, coupling as a function of time. So we consider a quantized field in the coplanar waveguide. So we write the phase field or the transmission line, which is governed by the wave equation. And it has independent left and right propagating components. So this one here propagates to the right along the x-axis, this one to the left. And this is the annihilation operator for photons propagating to the right and the initial operator for propagating on the left is the impedance of the coplanar waveguide. So this is the phase field or transmission line governed by this wave equation. We can insert this in the boundary condition and we solve it using input output theory, which is standard in quantum optics. So therefore at the end, we get an expression. And then the question is, which is the actual, essentially photon flux coming out of the, out of this uh, cavity, this, uh, this open cavity. The open cavity, you can think of it as a trombone. In a trombone, you change the length of the resonators. You go, mm -hmm. this frequency of the trombone changes because you're changing the length. So therefore, what you saw before is the quantum analog of a trombone. It's exactly this. And, uh, okay, so now we have this here. Uh, so the input-output analysis for a static flux gives us this output in terms of the input here. And then there are some essentially estimates that can be done here. Essentially, the physical interpretation is that the effective length, it's uh, essentially, it's, uh, is the point where the field is zero. And then from there is uh, essentially the fast oscillation is changing the boundary condition. It's like, it's like non adiabatic relativistic change of the boundary condition about like a quarter of the speed of light. So therefore the effective length of the squid can be controlled and it's a function of energy of the applied flux and it's tunable. And here is when you change the applied flux, you're modulating the effective length. So the applied flux is coming here and the effective length in millimeters changes here. So the effective length can be actually, these are measure actually, this is this, this can be obtained. And this is just, and also this is a theory one, the measure will be coming in a moment. So therefore this one here, it's just an energy also changes as a function of the 
the drive. And then uh, we can derive the output in terms of the input with, uh, with this expression here, the speed of light in the coplanar waveguide given by this uh, inductance and the capacitance. Now the expectation values in the correlation function for the output field can be calculated. For example, the photon flux in the output field for a thermal input field has this output here in terms of the input, and there are, these are the reflected thermal photons, which are there, so the system is not at t equals zero, and the additional ones with the dynamic Casimir effect photons. These are the ones we want to measure, separated from these ones here. So now let's plot the thermal photon contribution here, which we have an expression, and the dynamic Casimir effect, which we have an expression also. So therefore, it's, this is the predicted auto flux, uh, photon flux density versus mode frequency. So this produces a broadband photon production below the driving frequency. So therefore the red are the thermal photons that become very high at low frequency. The blue and the green ones are analytical results. So the, the part on the dynamic Casimir effect comes here and gets down here. And when you add them together, it gives you this part here. So the focus has been mostly from the middle up here to avoid the thermal ones. And this is done at T equal 50 millikelvin. The experiment I'll show you in a moment were done also at 20 millikelvin and more recently 10 millikelvin. And then the thermal part is pushed out further and further away. So you can actually see better the bump, which is the dynamical Casimir effect part. The Joseph plasma frequency in this case about 45 gigahertz, the driving frequency is lower, it's about 18 gigahertz. And then, uh, so this is a comparison what happens when you have a single mirror DC low Q resonator, DC high Q resonator, this is DC parametric oscillator. In this case, there is no classical analog, no classical analog. In this case, there is a regime you can, you can get classical analogs and you can get the sharply peak resonance around half of the driving frequency. Once you go to low Q, this resonance broadens off, off resonance. Once you go to single mirror DC, you get a broadband spectrum with a peak. So therefore we want this kind of spectrum and not these, and certainly not this one here, because this one here can be obtained either, uh, this one is, can be obtained like classically. So we want to see the spectrum at low enough temperature. When the temperature increases, eventually there's a, the thermal part essentially messing up this part here, but you can see this part bump here up to here, typically. And the most recent experiments even up to here. So this creates, can be proved, two mode squeeze states are collected photon pairs, and it's possible to measure broadband quadra quadrature squeezing. This is the predicted one. This is squeezing spectrum for a parametric oscillator with a kernel linearity. This can be measured with standard homodyne detection, standard quantum optics. So the photon correlations at different frequencies are a signature of the quantum generation process. Solid lines, resonator setup, dash line, the open waveguide. We have an open waveguide. It's a, it's a trombone. The experiment on top schematic. And if you look at the picture here, Complete a waveguide, you magnify the squid, this one here, the Johnson Johnson is here and here. All of this enters in this box here, which is located uh, here it is. Essentially is like a essentially all of this is the uh, here it is. So therefore this part here is a squid. And then uh, and all of this is placed here, and there's this drive line where you're driving it, and the photons are coming in this direction, complete waveguide. So all this transmission line and the squid are inside this red box here, which is shown right here. So this is the schematic of the experiment circuit, the micrograph and the circuit here. The tunability, it can be seen by changing the magnetic flux. You can see the effective electrical length is actually changing as a function of flux here. So this with the applying the static field and also doing a dynamic field. The, at low temperature, the, the thermal photons are exponentially suppressed. So therefore at five gigahertz is less than 0 0.1 average number of photons is very small. 
So therefore the thermal ones are suppressed and then the measurements are done in this regime here, from here to here. So this is, so the measurements are done here on the, so this is the new zero frequency and then it's done on the right side and on the left side and the question is, are they symmetric or not? And then they are, they are superimposed to see if the spectrum on the left side of the radiation and the right side are the same. So we need to see symmetric spectrum around zero detuning, which is right here, from the half pump frequency. So this is the detuning away from the peak. When you look at this in the experiment, you superimpose them and you see there is symmetry because this is one on the left, this one on the right. No, this one, sorry, this is one on the right, exactly right, this one on the left. So the frequencies are shifted and put on top. And then you can do the following. You can look at, for instance, what happens at the, uh, here at this box, around 350 to 500 megahertz, negative and positive frequencies versus pump power, the photon flux density is essentially the same. This is the average photon flux in the ranges indicated above. Then you can look at the different range right here is essentially the same, or you can look at a cut. If you cut here, at this point here, and you can see that the data and the theory are essentially indistinguishable. This is at this frequency here. So there were many, many different tests, and then the broadband photon production was observed. The spectrum is symmetric. And then this is... You have five minutes, okay? Sorry, Hamar? Five minutes. Okay, okay, good, uh, hurry up. So these are the dry boundary conditions at 10 gigahertz. We're starting from the vacuum. We see the broadband photon flux initially increasing with effective velocity V squared and then it saturates. At 10 millikelvin, then the suppression is even larger. And then this is using these parameters here. And then the same results can be obtained. This is dry frequency 11 gigahertz, plasma frequency 36 gigahertz. And again, they give the same essentially uh, symmetric uh, spectrum. The measurement of the two mode correlations involve these voltage quadratures involving this output. You add them up, which is essentially equivalent to X, you take a difference, which is equivalent to P. So it's like the X, P quadratures. So these are symmetric around half the driving frequency. So there is a detuning from the half frequency to the left and to the right. So there is a strong two-mode squeezing is observed only if when you get this condition here, which is a strong indication for photon pair production. So therefore, a in this case, single mode squeezing is not observed as expected from dynamic asymmetry theory. So it's only two photon correlations are created. So therefore you can get in this case, one mode is zero experimentally, is zero theoretically, and two mode, it goes non-zero. With the pump power increases, eventually saturates. And this is the correlation is just uh, very strong here. So the, the two mode squeezing, it works very well. You can do with the pump on or the pump off. The pump off, you give you zero essentially because the pump off, you need to magnify by a hundred and essentially it's within noise levels here. The pump on is just, uh, the quadrature correlations are very strong for two more squeezing. The signal to noise ratio is over a thousand compared to any parasitic correlations of the amplifier. Exactly, like in this case is 0 0.01 of a percent. In this case, a percent. So there is essentially like a, the, the two most squeezing quadratic correlations are, it's a clear smoking gun evidence there, like they have a common origin here. So therefore, what we did here is a non adiabatic modulation of the coupling, and the goal is to observe this virtual photon, this is to force these virtual photons to get out, to be emitted. And then we propose this uh, non adiabatic modulation, and then uh, and this is the one. The more recent results were about two years ago is essentially observing broadband entanglement in micro radiation from a single time variable boundary condition. It is the same as before, but they were like done more with more accuracy, more systematically. So now we introduce a circuit for observing dynamic asymmetry effect in superconductor circuits. A terminating the component because it allows the boundary condition to be tuned. This boundary condition is equivalent to that of a perfect mirror in an effective distance. 
Y si nosotros la modulación resulta en broadband en la microsimilar radiación, consiste two mode correlated photons. The experimental measure agree with the predicted broadband radiation, the expected two mode correlation and symmetry, and this is the first experimental demonstration of the effect after 40 years. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Franco. I think, uh, yeah, we have one question. I'm, I'm still awake, so you can ask questions until uh, I follow. Thank you, Franco. Very nice talk. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Uh, who, who's asking the question? Philip Kurian. Oh, okay. DC. Okay, nice meet you. <laughs> nice meeting you, too. Um, so very nice talk. Um, I had two questions. One, you, you showed uh, the case of weak coupling in the Josephson junction. So my question was, uh, what happens in the case of strong coupling? And then, is it possible to enhance the dynamical Casimir effect with materials which have uh, a stronger Chi-3 effect? And have you considered that versus the Chi-2 effect? Okay, that's a very good question. The material aspect is important to pump up the Joson plasma frequency high, because the question people are asking me, hey, you can get to a quarter of the speed of light, can you get to half, three quarters, Yes, but that requires a material issue. A material will be, then it, when I talk to experiment, they tell me that they all use aluminum because that's the way electromilitography is done. But niobium is also available in some groups. And I'm trying to get one of them to finally do it, but the funding is done to do quantum computing, not to do this dynamic similar effect. It's just, uh, so therefore I'm trying to twist his arm because with, with uh, niobium, the, the plasma frequency is high. You could get to half or even higher or the speed of light and the relativistic effects will be higher. So the material aspects are important, but not in terms of Chi-2 and Chi-3, but more in the terms of, uh, of uh, just on plasma frequency to be able to achieve a higher frequency. The other question was regarding the ultrasound coupling limit. It's a very, very good question, but then we're approaching this on the mechanical, if we're talking to different groups and the question is how to convert virtual photos into real ones. We have several proposals. And then in the case, we're trying to figure out how to achieve the ultra strong coupling limit to be able to, at that point, the rotating wave approximation breaks down and then you can actually grab particles from the vacuum. And it's essentially this is an area where we're very, very interested, but the experiments are moving. This is a growing field. It's, uh, we have a review on that topic of many, many papers, but the experiments are still lagging behind. I think the, the renaissance of the field will be in the next five to 10 years because then people can actually get photons in and out from the vacuum and being able to measure super and circuit because it's more, we would like to do it mechanically, mechanically stuff, but essentially ultrasound coupling is a way to go. But these are two interesting questions and we're still working on related topics. So. Uh, hi, Franco, this is Shan Hui Pham from Stanford. Very nice oh. talk. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, wondering if the same setup can be used to measure other effects that you talked about, for example, the OMRU effects. It, this is an issue that I've been talking with Miles Blanco. He started to use superconductor circuits to do dynamic semi He published a paper with Paul Nation. He was his student, he became my postdoc. But then the setup they have didn't work experimentally. So right now we're thinking about modify the setup to do Hawking radiation first. The UNRU effect is a bit trickier because then it's uh, accelerating. I just got a new postdoc. We're going to explore this option here, but the expert on this has been essentially Miles Blencom, collaborator and friend for many years. And the postdoc, uh, uh, they just arrived in our group. So it's, uh, there is work ongoing on the UNRU effect and uh, Miles is working on this. And, and if I get some result that would be close to experiment, I'll, I'll certainly let you know, but uh, the proposals are there, mostly Blanco's proposals, and uh, the experiments are not there yet. Yeah, thank you. We have one question. Thank you. Um, Ramin Golestanian from Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization. Thanks for the very nice talk, uh, Franco. Oh, um, I have a rather technical question about the shape of the spectrum that you showed uh, to do with dimensionality. So we know that when you do the calculation for one plus one dimension, you get this parabolic, inverted parabolic shape for the pair of squeezed uh, photons, uh, as you describe it. But when the system is actually in um, higher dimensions, still having the same 
symmetry. So three plus one, let's say, a, a flat plate in three dimensions moving only in one uh, direction, then the shape of the spectrum actually changes a little bit. You introduce higher powers uh, because of geometric measures. And I was expecting to see that in the experimental data because that must be in three plus one dimension. Um, can you comment yeah. on that, please? Yes, the environment we have is essentially 1D. Even though the, the system is in 3D, essentially is the whole th the, the 3D aspect essentially is squeezed on the Z axis is very much squeezed. It's 2D and the 2D aspects are very, very tiny and all the action happens in 1D, the confined field is 1D. So for all practical purposes, this is a 1D coplanar waveguide. It's, uh, it could be made, some people are doing more the 3D cavities. There are some, some more uh, bulky ones, but these ones are as flat as you can get. This is essentially like, uh, essentially it's a 1D electromagnetic environment. It's, uh, it would be nice to be able to repeat the experiment on a more, 3D cavity that can be made, but requires more effort to make it thicker. And then, uh, a, but then what do you gain? You gain a slightly asymmetric, but then we want to, the beauty of the symmetric part is that you're removing the thermal part because the thermal part is asymmetric. Of course, can be removed by going from 50 millikelvin to 20 and then to 10, which experimentalists did, but uh, it's, uh, it could be done, but it would be a lot of effort and they, there would be no, no clear punchline, I, I could see it. I know it's a... Also the problem with this field is that experimentalists typically don't, don't work on this because the funding is geared towards essentially quantum computing or some other yeah, areas. So that... Maybe we can talk about this later. Basically my comment is very simple. If, if a system is in one plus one D, the spectrum is omega times omega naught minus omega. So it's a parabola. If it is a plate which is moving in one D, then it has the, the, the fourth power. Uh, simply because of dimensionality. And then you expect the ends of it to be positively curved. So you, you expect to have a bell shape curve for the distribution. Uh, it's a simple geometric uh, comment, but maybe we can talk about it later. But how, how do you put a plate? Essentially the plate is gonna be difficult, I think, uh, to move in a 2D plate, it's, uh, it's uh, because the system here is a fairly one dimensional actually. Experimentally, I don't see how to move a plate. I, I could see like, uh, uh, mechanically perhaps, but uh, electromagnetically in these uh, 1D systems is going to be difficult actually. Okay, thank you. Hmm. So, another question? If not, I think we are reaching the time, so we can thank Thank you again. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Franco.